Today I'm joined by Kerry Simmons. <music> Kerry is Olympic champion 2016, representing the US in rowing. Further achievements, two times world champion, one time runner up. Welcome at the World Championships. Welcome, Kerry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Kerry, for having me. Kerry, it seems like in rowing, you had the best results with the women's aid, so the World Championships and the Olympic title. But the runner-up was in the two coxless. What would yeah. you say are the biggest differences between these disciplines? So we would call it the pair for rowers, the, the two-person boat there. Um, biggest differences, there's a lot. I won't get too into like all the technical differences, but certainly there's just two of you in the boat now going down the course versus eight in a coxswain. I think that more countries can field, you know, these small boats, these two person boats, um, and eight being fast and getting eight people in a coxswain to go really fast is a little bit more challenging for smaller countries and certainly for the u.s athletes college rowing is all about eights racing so we have a lot of experience you know coming up from college um, in that boat class so the pair is definitely something that we kind of do more as we were doing it with the u.s team so um it's challenging you can feel a lot in that boat it's really fun i'd say i like it better than the eight to be quite honest but um for, for, for many reasons, but the eight goes really fast and that's fun too. But yeah, there's a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. Why we were successful in the eight, I think just the US is really strong in that boat class. Yeah, especially in the last two decades or three decades. Three, yeah, three Olympic titles. We had, a, we had some pressure going into 2016 to kind of represent, so. Yeah, I, I have that for later. We speak about that. <laughs> okay. you, yeah. you got into rowing quite late, isn't it? So... People always kind of think, wow, like you started in college. That's so crazy. But half of my boat in 2016, so half of the women in that eight were walk-ons is what we'd call it in college. So it's not as uncommon to enter rowing later. There's a lot of opportunity for women at the college level to row. So it's not as uncommon as you'd think. Um, I do know I had a teammate that started after college. She was a softball and volleyball athlete um in college and then found rowing after so i'd say that's probably the less common but to find it in college is you know about half and half hmm. interesting in your life as an athlete what was your darkest moment yeah the darkest moment that's actually pretty easy for me um and it's interesting the timing of it because i think it gave me a lot of perspective but it happened it was when i got pretty injured i hurt my rib And if you're an athlete, you know that rib injuries can take anywhere from four to six weeks typically to heal. Um, so that happened at the end of 2015. So it was the Olympic year, so to speak, when I was just stuck on the stationary bike. And it was dark because I didn't really have my teammates around me. I was kind of on the bike while they were out rowing. Um, The bike is just hard because it's, you're sitting in your own sweat. It's hard sometimes to stay motivated when you're just kind of like getting after it on your own. And um, mentally, it was definitely the darkest moment. But I think that the timing of that happening on the heel or right before the Olympics was very healthy for me to have because when I'll just elaborate on this. When you go to the Olympics, everything is awesome. You're like, well, I could do this again. Um, this is great. And I think having that injury kind of right before or during that year up to the Olympics, it allowed me to be like, well, no, but I do remember this dark moment. There's pros and cons to this lifestyle. Um, and so I think that was very healthy for me to go through that. And I felt very, I felt definitely stronger mentally after, for sure. Yeah. How did you recover from it? I mean, I guess it was just a few months out of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. How did you get so, through it? Yeah. Um, yeah, the hardest part was actually building back into the team. Like, okay, you heal your rib and now learning to trust your body again. Um, we were a part of a very deep competitive team. So 
it was a challenge to fight back my spot on that team. Um, how did I recover one day at a time? And just kind of knowing like, okay, this is the Olympic year. I just got to go for it. And I can't really think about the what ifs in that equation. I just kind of have to do what I can and hope that it's good enough at the end of it. When were the tryouts before or after the injury? Oh, they were much later. So I got injured probably Thanksgiving. So for the American holiday is in end of November. Um, was out till mid January on the bike, started to transition back to rowing in January, probably was at full volume again by February. And we started selection for kind of the seat for the Olympic team. We started selection in March. Yeah. Team wasn't named till June. So, yeah, really like a month before the Olympics, basically. Publicly or also to the athletes? I would say we knew maybe a week before the public knew. Okay, so not much more than that. No, yeah, like find the fastest athletes that are the fastest before, you know, like at that time. Yeah, yeah. It's it would be hard to think name it any earlier because a lot of things can happen in a you know month, two months. So yeah, we don't have selection until kind of the very end of it. Hmm. What was your best moment? Um, I think the best moment for me and kind of a turning point in just my confidence as an athlete, as a rower on that team, was when we have selection regattas in those two-person boats in the pairs and we call it the national selection regatta it's intra-squad racing and honestly like probably the toughest racing that i'll have ever done because it was such a competitive squad to be a part of so um when i won the national selection regatta with my pair partner and that year we actually went on to represent the pair for the u.s that summer When I won the NSR, it was just, I didn't expect it. She, didn't, My partner didn't expect it. We just kind of went out there just to see how fast we could go. Um, and it clicked and it started going fast. And it was just really cool to feel like, wow, I'm, I can contribute to this team in a major way and feel like you're an impact on the team and that you uh, are not bad at really. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely a confidence boost. So that was a lot of fun. I'd say that that was a huge moment. And then I'd say the other one would be just making the Olympic team, finding out that I'd made it after four, five years of training with this team. And um, it was a emotionally and mentally really hard selection process. So just to feel like I was able to come out on the winning side of that selection process was really awesome. So making it was much more enjoyable than the title? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, winning a gold medal um, in front of your family and your friends and representing the U.S. is incredible. Um, and to do that on the Olympic stage is uh, its something that I will always have that memory. And um, I'm happy to kind of share that, that memory with people that care to listen. But Making the team was the hardest thing for sure. It was harder than competing against other countries. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Which is a cool thing to say. Like that's how competitive our team was. I would say there's probably about eight other women that could have been in my seat. Like honestly, maybe six other women that could have yeah. made that boat just as fast. Yeah. Yeah. You hear, you have some sports that are like this, right? That the uh, competition inside the country For the Olympics is higher than actually. Yeah, I'm getting like kind of nervous just talking about it again. Why is yeah. that? Yeah. Why is that? Oh, why is that? Oh, I mean, you just, uh, when you relive memories, you kind of have those emotions tied to them and talking about Olympic selection. And um, as much as I appreciated that experience and grateful for how much it's taught me, I, I don't think I want to go through it again. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, cool. All good. <laughs> <laughs> in that Olympic final in 2016, you guys were behind after 500 meters, 
after mm-hmm. 1,000 meters. And from 1,500 meters, you were kind of leading. Were you ever worried to not bring it home? Yeah, no, I think this is something that was asked to our squad following the games. We did kind of a social media day. Actually, I think we did it on the same day as our race. We had to do a fair amount of interviews. And I think we could all agree as the boat that we were prepared for crews to put on the pressure early and really try to kind of get out ahead and just hold on. And so we were not surprised when that happened. It was not like jarring. And I think we all, we all had a plan that we were going to race the first thousand, the first half pretty internal, just like execute the plan, um, listen to our coxswain and then go in the offense big time in the second half. And really, if someone's hanging with us in the thousand, at the thousand, just kind of make them pay for it by that point. And I think um, rowing is interesting because that 2K distance is tricky. You know, the crews that were leading one, two, and the thousand actually didn't medal that race. So pacing is a part of it. And um we were pretty prepared that, hey, if they're going to hang, we're just going to make them pay in that second thousand. And I think that that's kind of what we did. So um, we were ready to make a move in that third 500 and just waiting for the coxswain to call it. And when the time came, we were pretty, <laughs> you could just feel the the response throughout the whole boat is really a quite cool feeling. Yeah. If you could travel back in time, 10, 15, 20 years, what advice would you give a younger you? Okay, so I'm going to give my age here. So 10, 15 years, I would be about 16. Okay. Um, definitely didn't have the Olympics on my radar as like, oh, that's a realistic dream. I think that was a good thing in a way because I didn't have expectations put on me to, to be like this uh, – elite athlete but at the same time like I would encourage my younger self and those that are younger that like you know dream big there's no nothing to lose by kind of setting your goals high but at the same time you need to also be realistic and set kind of manageable manageable goals to kind of get yourself in that direction of a bigger goal so I guess I was lucky as a kid that I never had anyone tell me I couldn't do something. And I think that I would be that voice as well. Like you can really do anything you want. um, If you work hard enough and you put the time in, Um, there is some natural talent at times and just being in the right place at the right time and taking the opportunity. But, you know, dream big would probably be the thing I would say. Yeah. Cool. It seems you came into the sport quite late, but it also seems you left it early. Is that a fair assumption to say? Just take the gold medal to world championships titles and then move on? Yeah, um, I would say it's not like there are a few like me. um, But yeah, it's not uncommon to do two cycles, right? Um, I have teammates that are on their third and fourth right now. So I think it's very personal decision. I think for me, I was ready. I did not want to have my entire twenties be in this kind of elite athlete lifestyle. I I wanted to find some more balance. So I think it's kind of knowing yourself and being okay with what choice you want to make with it. So yeah, I think maybe I could have done another, but um, I'm happy with my decision to move forward and, or not move forward, but move on to something different. When did this decision come? Officially, this decision was, uh, it didn't happen until 2019. So I made this decision in January to like officially retire. I kind of like had it always in my mind um, in 2017, 2018, did a little bit of training in the fall of 2018 to really make sure like, okay, is this realistic that I could come back and um, do I want to? And I think my body was just, it, I could have built it back, I'm sure, but I just didn't want to limp through two more years of elite rowing. And I think mentally and emotionally, I was just like ready to be, to be done. So it was a little bit late. I'd say 2019 is when I officially was at peace with retiring. Okay, cool. 
what are the habits that make you a successful athlete and person? Okay, so habits is like kind of, I don't know, that translates a little weird for English. I think it's a good question, but I think I'm going to just say mentality. I'm going to focus on the mentality part because I think there's a lot of like ways to perform better and, and those good habits. But I think mentally that's kind of where I was strong in the sense that um, I was pretty internal. I was external when I needed to be. I'm, I'm definitely a competitive person, but I think I'm more competitive with myself and I don't need the gratification of beating someone else or, or um, kind of obsessing over what they did or how are they doing this? Did they do an extra workout? How did they do on that workout? I was just kind of pretty focused on my progress, what I needed to do. Did I do that well? How am I going to do it better next time? So that kind of being able to be internal at times, I think was very helpful because it's really easy to get intimidated by your teammates <laughs> that are very good and talented um, and not obsessing over small details. Cause it's gonna, there's going to be days where you're going to have a kind of bad training session and not let that get to you, be able to let that go and just kind of big picture think about it. So mentality of staying internal and kind of keeping this, big picture sometimes when you you know sometimes you're just so in it and you need to just zoom out and kind of keep some perspective on things so that was very helpful in training for the olympics just every once in a while zoom out i'm okay stay you know keep some perspective you know just do your best so that's what i would say was something that I think I did a good job as an athlete. And did you always have this or did it somewhere develop along the years? I think I was always pretty good at it. <laughs> um, I was very balanced as a high school athlete. I was a three sport athlete. So I, I never really did like one sport and that was it. Um, in a way that was limiting because I never fully reached my potential at any of those sports. But I think that was kind of healthy in a way because um, there wasn't huge pressure that I was putting on myself or others were putting on me. Um, when I rode in college, I was pretty good at keeping that balance with like friends and school and then rowing and not making it like my life. And so when it became my full-time job to row, um, I think I had some of these kind of ability to keep some balance and not self-sabotage mentally, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you mentioned you think you didn't reach your full potential. Is that also true for rowing? <sighs> you know, you never know. I think that's why ah, people that is keep true. doing that is true. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I probably would say, like, if I kept going, I'm sure I could, you know, continue to improve in some areas. Um, but I think that there's trades off, trade offs to trying to find out. Like, I think the goal is to always keep pushing your your capacity. Um, I got, I feel like I I got some good information about my uh, capacity for hard work and my kind of mental capacity but yeah no i i don't who knows if you reached your potential who knows yeah that leads perfectly into the note i've taken here you put you've wrote on your linkedin profile rowing has taught me discipline and how to perform in high pressure situations i mean it was yeah. a bit of a longer sentence but i've taken that out um can you elaborate on that Yeah, I mean, rowing is basically, I mean, our practice sessions were kind of just a testing ground to um, explore your grit. I'd say that would be a good word for rowing. Explore your, and grit, what I mean by that is, yes, your physical abilities to push hard, but also the mentality behind that. And, you know, they always, a lot of people say, and I'm sure you've heard this, Christian, it's like, mentally, you're going to limit yourself before your body gives out, you're going to kind of shut it down. Um, so practicing over and over in these situations to push past that kind of mental barrier and go into that 
I, I guess they'd call it the pain cave here, the dark area, um, and kind of explore that. So rowing allows you to kind of go through this trauma in a very safe way um, amongst your teammates. And I think that you explore these new depths of hard work and, and what your capacity is mentally for that. And so, yeah, I think that that's kind of what I mean is like, you just practice discipline, you practice working really hard over and over. And it teaches you a lot about what you're capable of. And I think it can definitely be applied to other areas of your life. Yeah. That's what they say probably all over the world, but I know in Germany, they say rowing makes tough. Yeah. You kind of have to be tough to go through that sport. Yeah. It's a lot of work and less, not that much glory for that amount of work. So. Yeah. Um, until the Rio Olympics, if my research is correct, the U.S. women's aid didn't lose the world championships or Olympics since 2005. So that's 11 years. In your opinion, what's 2005 the or six? Okay, I thought, well, anyway, it's, it's 11 or 10 years of dominance. Yeah, yeah, I think what it was 11, think, but yeah. What do you think is I the think. reason for it? What, what's the reason? Oh, the gosh, reason so I was dominance? talking to a teammate about this. She's still training, and we caught up the other day, and we were kind of talking about, like, what made, like, at least for what we call our quad, our four-year cycle, what was made it so dominant? in that event and you know we had a really solid team like it wasn't just the eight that was doing well in 2015 we had our women's quad win our women's eight win our women's four win and then the pair got third so it was just every boat medaled it was crazy um and i think it's hard to say like this is what set us apart from this team i think what we kind of decided was like well we were really um competitive in a very i think professional way it was it was definitely the best team i've ever been a part of and the fact that we were really good about beating each other up on the water and then leaving it on the water so there wasn't i i think there wasn't a lot of drama certainly not like compared to college rowing where you know it's just young women and you're always together and there's going to be some drama i think this was a very professional group And we trusted the process and we knew that if we put in the work and we really went after it every day that we would win. So there was a confidence in the process, a trust in the process and knowing that, Hey, if you got through this process and we're still standing and you got named to the boat that like we trusted each other to do what we needed to do to cross the line first. So Yeah, I don't, I don't really, yeah, as far as the teams before us, I think it was really awesome to have this kind of um, platform to go off of, like, oh, these women were really good, and we want to keep moving, carrying that forward, and they passed the torch to us, and, you know, there is some responsibility to that, like, we want to represent not just the U.S. well, but we want to represent these women that came before us well. So, I don't know. That's all I can speak to, I guess. We were pretty confident in a good, healthy way. Not cocky, just confident in what we were doing. And it seems the team is bigger than the individual. Oh, yeah. It was a really good team. Yeah. Really good team. Cool. Do you have a morning routine? Not anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's pandemic time. So um, I would say I was one of those people that probably had a routine, kind of, but I was not obsessive over it. And I think that that's probably a good thing. Um, you know, you wake up, I think we didn't wake up terribly early, but I definitely most mornings would wake up before six. Um, I would be a coffee drinker. Uh, gotta be careful with that. Don't want to become too dependent on coffee, but I definitely did drink it. Um, I think my go-to meal was oatmeal. Um, 
but you know, it would change. Sometimes you just kind of have to listen to your body. Maybe you got up earlier. Maybe you needed more sleep when I went to bed varied. So the short answer is no. If like, if we talk about routine, routine, generally speaking, sure. Yeah. Now pandemic times, I'm trying to keep some more like routine, but it's not like anyone's counting on me to be in a routine. Yeah. Okay. How do you prepare for important moments? Um, I think I breathe. Breathing. I think breathing is a good thing to do before you do important moments. Um, breathing and then trusting that you are prepared. And you kind of answered it earlier here, but also I saw it, or I listened to a podcast you were featured in. You said that the tryouts for the Olympics was mentally and emotionally the toughest for you. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate yeah, I how mean, you prepared for that? Yeah, I mean, to touch on that again, you're right. Like that was something that kind of spoke on in, in this podcast. You are competing against people for a spot and you know them very well. You've trained with some of them for four to five years. You respect them immensely and you know at the end of the day that one of you is not going to make it. And that's really hard. That's really hard. So um, you just kind of have to surrender to like, look, if you make that boat go faster on that day, you deserve it. If I make that boat go faster, then I hope that you think that, hey, that you deserve it. But um, yeah, it's just, I had some friends that didn't make the boats that they wanted to make. And you feel for them because you know that, could have so easily been you um and for some reason it wasn't you know for whatever reason it worked out that i was able to give a performance that allowed me to earn that spot so and not everything's always like black and white like this is so it's not track and field where you just race and that's who gets it it's sometimes the parameters of racing change the coach might put you in first and then the other one gets to race and It's not always super fair. So you have to surrender to that as well and just know that, hey, if you're going to make it go faster, you just got to bring it and hope it's enough. So what I hear for you, it was more the empathy aspect of and friendship of, you know, some people missing out that are close to you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just really hard to compete against your friends when it's much easier to compete against just people that you are competitors and you don't really know them. Um, so yes. And I don't want to come across like, Oh, I pity them. because I certainly like, don't want that. No one wants pity from me. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, it's kind of that emotional, emotional element of one of you is not going to make it. And I really want it to be me, but I also know how terrible it's going to feel if it's not you. Yeah. Yeah. How do you overcome setbacks? Yeah, so I actually just kind of went through my whole, um, a whole year where I was applying to physical therapy school. I, you know, put forth my application. This is kind of like a last, not a, just a later tra career transition for me, but I feel really good about it. Um, and I was getting like rejected from programs. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, kind of, starting to wrap my head around like there's a good chance that I don't get into school this year and like what am I going to do okay apply again I need to figure out how I'm going to like sustain myself so I'd have to get a job so just kind of this setback in the sense of my plan a I wasn't sure it was going to work and kind of mentally being prepared to adapt and adjust as needed so Yeah, I think for me, it was, I had to kind of recenter myself and be like, okay, like this is, this is a likely possibility and I'm just going to trust that if I need to, I will just adapt. And I think rowing has given me a lot of confidence that I can be very adaptable and 
that things are going to be okay. I just need to be patient and trust the process. That sounds incredibly cheesy, but trust the process is like a very good lesson um, to learn. And I think Relling taught me that and I reapplied it in many areas of life now. And this was the latest one. So I did get into school. So Congratulations. <laughs> at the end of it, yeah. So that was really awesome, but I was definitely prepared for, you know, having to adjust or pivot my plan a little bit. Yeah. Who's your role model and why? I don't just have one. I don't have one role model. Um, this is probably the hardest question. I'm not going to lie because I think there's not a clear answer that I can give. I can't just name a person. I think name it was you. awesome. I, I, it was awesome to grow up in a time where you had some really boss women in sport. You know, I had Mia Hamm when I was playing soccer. Sorry about the bing. Um, we had you know, Carrie Walsh and Misty May playing beach volleyball. That was awesome to see them dominate um, in the Olympics. But I think for me, like I had women in my life that were just strong. So I'd say my mom, Karen, she was doing ultra running. I was seven watching like her just do a hundred mile races, which was nuts. Um, I just had some really like, I think strong women, teachers, parents. I'm not going to say my younger sisters, but I love how strong they are now. But yeah, growing up, I think I just was exposed to a lot of really awesome people that definitely didn't put any limits on me because I was a woman. And I think um, to, to single out one role model is really hard for me. <laughs> I think I had a lot of influences, which was great. And I hope like that I can just be a small influence on someone else. Not the only role model, but just maybe one of them. Yeah, that's cool. What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? Okay. So <laughs> again, you, you best advice is hard to say, but I think that an advice that's stuck with me for a long time was actually just a teammate. I had just moved to the training center. So I went to school in Seattle, which is on the West Coast for those that are, I don't know where that is. Um, and Princeton, New Jersey is on the East Coast. So it's, you know, six hours flight time, different place of the United, the United States is very big. So it's a different place. So that was an adjustment. Didn't know a lot of people. I was coming into the training center group as a college graduate. I was the slowest. One of the slowest, I, you know, came from a program where I was one of the best athletes and now I was at the bottom. And a lot of these women were training for London. So they were just like intimidating. <laughs> and I had a teammate who was training for the London Olympics. She just kind of one day came up to me and we were kind of stretching after practice. And I don't know how it came up, but she's just like, kind of like hey how's it going and um we kind of talked about the erg workout and where my pace was and she's like honestly like i was so much slower than you when i came in and like it just everyone's kind of starts somewhere and to kind of have that realization that these women that are really fast around me were once kind of here in this spot of like college grad slow And they just kind of work their way up. And just to have that reminder, like, hey, everyone starts somewhere. Um, even Olympians at one point were novices in their sport. And just kind of to have that reminder was really, really good in that time of my life. And I think that that's something that stuck with me because I think every time I've had to start over, whether it be with rowing, with coaching, with applying to physical therapy school, that I have to remind myself, you know, everyone starts at kind of the beginning. Everyone's a beginner at some point in their lives and it's totally okay. And um, if anything, like, I think it's really good to continue to always try to be a beginner at something yeah. and never like feel the pressure that you can't be incompetent <laughs> um, at, at some times in your life. It's just a part of the process. Yeah, I can fully relate to that. I once heard the saying, every master was once a disaster so yeah. 
every yeah, time okay. I feel like, oh God, what are you doing? Then that comes back and I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, There's still I a think chance you're better. I think as we get older, it's harder for us to become beginners at, or to want to be a beginner at something. Like, I don't know if you'd agree with that, but I think having like some courage to be like, it's okay if I look like a fool in this like new sport I'm doing or this new activity, it's, it's okay to not be like really good at it when you first do it. Um, I, I'm trying beach volleyball now. I do not look like an Olympic athlete. <laughs> That's for sure. But um, I think it's good to like be okay and just kind of be okay with being a novice at something. Yeah. Talking about advice, I heard in that podcast some advice you gave. Um, you want to surround yourself with like-minded people who understand what you're doing. Hmm. Now I want to challenge you. <laughs> Sometimes you have people in your network that are completely the opposite. What would you advise to do? Oh, this is good. I don't even remember saying that. So this is, it's interesting to hear myself four, three years ago, four years ago. Um, I'm going to think on this one. What would I do? So the question is, what would I do if I have the people in my network is, that are opposite yeah, or not like-minded? Yeah, right? the question is, you have this saying, you're the average of the five people around you, whatever. Yeah. So that always comes back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have people in your network who are not like-minded, who are not driven, who are the opposite. What do you do? Okay, so if you have the luxury, like remove yourself from that network. Um, There's definitely people that I just feel are a drain on my, to sound kind of hippie here, energy. I think we all know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Like there are people out there that you just feel exhausted <laughs> from being around and um, limiting that interaction or just kind of not being around it as much as possible is something that I try to do. Um, I think... Yeah, like, so if you're, you have the luxury to kind of choose who you want to be around, then choose not to be around those people. If you don't have the luxury, I think communication is always good. I think working on how can you communicate in a productive way is a healthy and a good thing. So I could be like, communicate to that person. Hey, I don't appreciate, I really am uncomfortable when you say these things or how you say it and just try to be productive and work together on like creating a more positive relationship with that person. So pick your battles. But I think if it's something that you cannot really remove yourself or, you know, it's a family member and you're related to them, like how can you communicate better so that you guys get on kind of the same page? Oftentimes there's a lot of just misunderstanding and miscommunication. So how can you kind of work through that? What's going on in Carrie's life at this moment in time? Yeah, so weird times. <laughs> FYI, this is this is in the midst of the pandemic when we're when we're talking right now. Um, I'm getting ready to start physical therapy school online at the end of this month, so uh, and, and June 1st. And um, I'm also working on virtual coaching, high school rowers. We call it Rower Academy. So I'm working with um, Luke Walton, who's another Olympic rower, San Diego native. We've worked together on a couple rowing clinics, and now we're kind of branching into, or at least I'm working with his company on um, helping high school athletes navigate the recruiting process for college rowing. And how that kind of looks is making them just more recruitable by helping them with their erging, their erg techniques, so the indoor rowing machine, because that's kind of a big deal for recruiting, as well as mentally and like those kind of race strategies, because I think we're able to relate to these kids, even though we're a little past college, we still know what it takes to approach a rowing test or what we call seat races and um, how to communicate with these coaches that are uh, at the college level. And so, yeah. That's kind of what I'm excited about that's new is, okay, like, 
I kind of left full-time coaching to pursue physical therapy school. And this is kind of a way for me to continue to work with young athletes and just make them better and stronger and able to contribute to their college program. And where can you find these services, the virtual coaching? Yeah. So I'd say online or Instagram, it's roweracademy.com. Okay, cool. Yep. So it's new. I'm excited about it. So if you're kind of a high school rower and you're gunning for college rowing, we're kind of a service that can kind of help yeah, be supplemental cool. coaching. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Yeah, I don't know anyone really cool that's not outside of rowing, but I would say someone that would be really cool for you to reach out to that I don't know is she's us but i would be really interested to hear because she was a role model of mine i'd be interested to hear from misty may the volleyball player um beach volleyball because i think she's just really cool and down to earth and i actually think she would maybe take the time to kind of chat about her story more than some other athletes i think sometimes just too in it already or so misty may would be kind of like <laughs> who I would love to, to see interviewed. Um, so I would, I would suggest reaching out to her, but I can't really be helpful with reaching out to her. So. I'll, I will find a way. I think also the interesting thing about her is she was Olympic champion. She became a mom and she came back and won again or something like that. Right. So she had a kid in between. And yeah. I don't hundred percent know if she had a kid or not, but yeah, she's just, someone that was just solid i just really you know we talk about role models i didn't know her at all or really know the kind of the qualities but i just really appreciated her steadiness in the game she just seemed like a cool person yeah i used to work with beach volleyball for some time and i okay. I, i saw her at a tournament but just playing there you go <laughs> So I saw you this one time at a tournament. <laughs> Remember that back in yes, 2011? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Where can people find you? Yeah, I mean, if people want to find me, I'm on pretty much every social media platform. Um, I'd say Facebook is probably more rowing related. Um, Carrie Simmons. Instagram. I'm ready to get off Instagram. <laughs> I feel like there's too much Instagramming going on in my life and in the pan pandemic, but certainly that is, I'm active on that as well. Cool. Carrie, thanks so much for your time. That was awesome. Yeah. It's fun to kind of go back in time. So appreciate the questions. Thank you.